praise Yahweh for that. Bless all the people of Yahweh of South Africa. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the message I have today that Yahweh put in my heart is called The Cost of Discipleship. Because although there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing of coming to faith and coming to the truth and getting eternal life dwelling within us, there is a cost. And like I always say, you know, that the good news, it is free, but it's not without cost. You know, when you look at the Bibles and the books, we can't go out there and pick them off a tree the way you could a piece of fruit. So, it's the same with Yahweh's salvation. That's not an extra song we're doing, are we? <laughs> That's why I love South Africa. <laughs> but uh, it's the same with Yahweh's grace. You know, it's it, it's free, but it's not without cost. So. Uh, this is called the cost of discipleship. And throughout the years, one of the things, because when we come out of, quote-unquote, Christianity, uh, many people say, the big question that's asked when people, what what denomination are you? What should we call ourselves? We don't want to call ourselves Christian because it, it doesn't really reflect what we are when we look at what Christianity is today. Uh, we're not Jews, although some people think that uh, they're Jewish or try to form Jewish. But what should we call ourselves? And when we look at Scripture, uh, we do see the word Christian there. It's there three times, even in the Aramaic Scriptures, because it meant something very different in the first century than what it does today. Uh, but it's only there three times. The word believer is there two times. You know, there's other words, the way, that's there a number of times. But the word that's there more than 250 times is disciple. That's what the word is there. And we know in English that word comes from the word discipline. You cannot be disciplined or be a disciple without being disciplined. And at the Bible school that I've done for 14, 15 years, one of the main premises of the school is teaching this. You know, what is a true believer? What is our, our calling to Yahweh? What is it all about? Uh, so disciple is the word that's used most of the time. That's what we are. We're disciples of Yeshua. And it's like an apprentice. You know, we're, we're learning the family business. And what is the family business? Making sons and daughters of Yahweh. That's Yahweh's family business. In Hebrew, that word comes from the word limud. That's the Hebrew word for disciple. And it's to be instructed or taught. To be instructed or taught. It comes from lamed, which is to goad with a rod. So the shepherd, when he has his shepherd's stick and he's trying to get the sheep in the right direction, he's gently nudging them. And that's the word lament, that's where it comes from. To go with a rod for incentive, to learn skillfully. So, uh, in Christianity, I don't think probably many Christians ask what is the cost of discipleship, right? Because there is a great cost, because most people think there's nothing. You know, that when you come to faith, Jesus did everything, and I do nothing, I have to do nothing. And the answer really is the total opposite of that. I, I believe that's the false good news message that we read about in Galatians and other places, a message that is not even in the uh, New Testament. But uh, there is a great cost to discipleship. So that's what I want to talk about today. Let's start in Luke 14, in verse 26. Because it's something that we should ask ourselves, certainly before baptism, uh, when we come to true repentance. And it's something we should really be asking ourselves throughout our, our, our calling as believers. You know, that, like I said, I, I, I also teach at the Bible school goal setting. And I say we should always have short term goals, you know, and then we should have medium term goals and we should have long term goals. So you may, may have goals for the week. You know, what you want to accomplish that week. I want to change the oil in my car. I want to read certain scriptures. I want to do. XYZ with my family, and then you can have medium-term goals. This year, I want to read the whole Old Testament uh, this year. Uh, we want to do this with our family this year. I want to do XYZ with the Matthew 24 program this year. And then we have our long-term goals. What do we need to change in our life? What do we need to change as believers? And uh, at least the medium-term and long-term goals should always be changing, because as we're changing, the goals change. And I equate our calling to archaeology. I've been blessed to work with archaeology for more than 20 years in Israel. 
and archaeology is a science, you know, it's not about rocks and digging, but it's a science. But what archaeology is, is you keep going down to levels to find more and deeper more. And that's one of the biggest problems in archaeology, is that when you're starting to dig, first you have to do a survey of, of the surface area to see if you think there could be something there. And then you start digging in squares, like a three meter by three meter by three meter square. And now when you come to something that you think is important, maybe you come to something from the Crusader time, there's a, uh, a Crusader sword that's there. Now as the, the head of that dig, you have to decide, do we destroy all this to go deeper? Is there something more important that's deeper or do we just leave it as it is? And that's for, like I said, the head archaeologist to decide. If he is going to destroy it, of course, they take pictures, they do drawings, but then they go deeper. And when you hit bedrock, you know you're at, there's no deeper to go. You know, that's the, the, the natural foundation that's there. But our calling is like that. We don't want to stop at the uh, Islamic level or the Crusader level or the Christian era. We want to go down to bedrock. We have to do that with our soul. And... In order to do that, we have to be continuously looking at our hearts and seeing what is my responsibility as a believer. So, yes, you know, Yeshua did everything. He did the sacrifice. Yes, Yahweh sacrificed his son. Yes, everything of the plan of salvation is based on Yahweh. But still, there is requirements that are Bible, many of them I'm going to read here today, that tells us that if you today, and I think everybody in this room considers themselves a disciple of Yeshua, right? An apprentice, a learner. If we want to really be a disciple, then we're going to read really plain language. It's not going to be in code or anything else that tells us what we have to do to be that disciple. So in Luke 14, starting in verse 26, he says, And if anyone comes to me and does not love less than me, his father, his mother, his wife, his children, brothers, sisters, and besides, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. That's, that's tough. You know, that there's nothing you could put before Abba Yahweh and Yeshua. If anyone does not love less, if anyone comes to me and does not love less than me, his father, his mother, his wife, his children, brothers and sisters, beside even his own life. And this is where you have to go deep and say, am I doing that? You know, am I doing that? Sometimes someone has an unconverted spouse and to save face from fighting, they might be compromising on Sabbath. I've had situations where the spouse would not let the converted spouse come to services. Now, I love my wife. My wife is a believer. When I got married, though, I told her, I said, I just want to tell you right now, you'll always be second in my life. That simple. The second thing I told her is, if I ever leave this faith, <laughs> you stay to it. Don't follow me. You know, you stay to, 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 to what you're, you're pure to. But sometimes I've seen where an unconverted spouse will put the unconverted uh or the, the converted spouse will put the unconverted spouse before Yahweh. Even for the point of not keeping Passover. You know, because the spouse wouldn't. And it could be a husband or a wife. It doesn't make a difference. And then or even, he says, even our own life. You know, that you think about it. There are 8 billion people in this world. And out of that 8 billion, how many are first fruit believers like you are? You know, it's, it's like a million to one. You know, I mean, in USA, people always talk about hitting the lottery and this and that. And actually, if you look at statistics, most people that win the lottery with money, their life winds up being destroyed after that because money is not going to solve all your problems. But that's more like hitting the lottery. The fact that there's 8 billion people out there and Yahweh called you. He called you. I, I tell the story, the last time I ever went to the Catholic Church, I was born into that. And when I was coming to truth, truth, and if anybody here is familiar with Catholicism, you know it's not interactive, you know, not at all. You basically sit there, they do their, their, their uh, repetitious prayers and whatnot, you know, you say these little repetitious prayers and you go. But this one time, there was a priest there I never saw before, he was from another area, and uh, I'm sitting there, there had to be 400 people in that audience, and he looked down, he pointed right at me, and he said, you stand up! Oh my him? <laughs> like, no, 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 you stand up. I stood up. He says, do you know the most important doctrine of the Catholic Church? 
And just instinctively, I said, yes, the collection box. <laughs> Only time I ever heard a laugh in the Catholic Church. So I said, sit down, sit down. But when the, 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 when the Mass was over, and I was walking out, and he was standing there waiting for me, he said, do you know why I picked you? He said, because I could see in your eyes you will be a priest someday. Well, little did he know. Last time I ever went there. Left there and never went back again. But that's the point of it. Is there anything in our life, is our job that we do conducive to this lifestyle that we're calling ourselves a disciple of Yeshua? Is the way we're treating our neighbor, our families, is uh, maybe we're doing in our spare time. You know, and I, and I, I say one of the first things we do at the, the Bible school is we make a list, a daily list, of what you do every day. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, and this is your homework today, you know. Write it down, what you do every single day. And then examine that and say, is this the lifestyle of a master or a slave? Is it the lifestyle of a master or a slave? Because slaves follow what the master tells them, as we're going to read here. But masters dictate what they want to do. Masters have free time to play golf and do other all other kinds of stuff. So is our lifestyle, you know, conducive to being a disciple of Yeshua? And one of our favorite quotes uh, of me and my wife is, let my life praise you. Our life should praise Yahweh. That when you think of what true praise is to our Heavenly Father, it has nothing to do with us, it has nothing to do with how good we could sing or not sing, it has nothing to do how good you could play an instrument, it has to do with your heart. It has to do with giving of your heart and your soul and just praising Him with every ounce of your being. And it's not only in, in music or instruments, it's whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might, Whatever we do, do to the glory of Yahweh. So if I'm a computer programmer, well, I'm going to make programs that people are going to come to the truth. I'm going to make programs of Bibles and books and literature. You know, If I'm a construction worker, I'm, before I build my house, I'm going to build the house of Yahweh. I'm going to build a place where the brethren can meet. I'm going to build a place where the widows have. Right? That's the lifestyle of a disciple. Loving your neighbor more than yourself. And this is what's required of us. That if you love your own life more, he doesn't say, you know, well, it's not so good. He says, you cannot be my disciple. That's what he's telling us. This is a strict requirement of basic discipleship 101. And whoever does not bear his torture stake and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Each of us have a torture stake, right? We come to faith, and uh, through the years, sometimes people want baptism. Sometimes even two baptisms and three baptisms. Sometimes they've been baptized already five times. They come to Israel and they just want me to baptize them in the Jordan River because they're thinking like some kind of miracle is going to happen. You know, like the, like the water is magical. Maybe like the Pool of Siloam or the or rather the uh, Pools of Bethesda, you know, where the angel came. But it's not, it's not like that. That each of us have a torture stake. And whatever that torture stake is in your life, for some people it could be pride. For some people it could be... Uh, an addiction of something you're trying to overcome. But whatever that torture stake is, if you're not able to bear that and come after him, you cannot be my disciple. You know, And that's why, as Yeshua spoke to these people and said to them some hard things in John 6, many turned back. Because they said, wow, there is a cost for discipleship, and you know what, I'm not ready to take it. But where do you turn to? You know, He said to the disciples, are you going to go to? He said, where do you go to? When you come to the truth, you know, when you've been to Mount Zion and you're there at the top, where do you go from there? You know, there's nowhere to go. Hmm. And unfortunately, if you look at suicide rates of people that are true believers that fall away are some of the highest of, of any group in the world because it's torture from there. Where do you go? Where do you go from there? And who of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has the things to finish? That having laid a foundation and not having strength to finish, all those seeing begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and did not have strength to finish. Or what king going to attack another king in war does not first sit down and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet those coming with 20,000. But if he is not, he being still far off sending a delegation, he asks the things for peace. So then every one of you who does not forsake all his possessions is not able to be my disciple. Wow. That's a tough saying. So now, when you look at this, uh, you have to look at it in context. What is Yahweh wanting us to do? Does He literally want us 
when we become a believer, to take every last thing we own, you know, whatever, give it away to the poor, do whatever. And that's what he's saying here? I don't believe so when you look at it. Because if you did that, then every one of us would be dependent on somebody else. We would make ourselves a burden if we did that. And that's not the way of Yahweh. It's not a kingdom principle. When he says, unless you're willing to forsake all your possessions, when you look that up, what he's saying really is, it's a mental thing. That when you become a believer, you have to realize there's nothing anymore you own. There's nothing you own. You don't have a car. You don't have a house. You don't even have children because everything belongs to Yahweh. You are a caretaker of what's in your possession. And now Yahweh is saying, okay, I'm going to leave this in your possession. What are you going to do with it? And I say that when I, I go in, in Western society, particularly in Western Europe and America, to the brethren there because there's a lot of people that have money and they're doing really good and they're living in big... It's almost the opposite of what we're reading. And I say, do you really think that Yahweh made you his banker for this? He had to put the money somewhere, right? Because, like we said, the stuff doesn't grow on trees. So Yahweh has to put his tithe, his money somewhere so it can be used functionally in his congregation. And what is it used for? It's used to build the tabernacle. It's used for the widow and the poor. It's used to bring the good news out. It's used to put Bibles in people's hands. It's used for something that's functional. So there has to be somebody on earth, you know, that Yahweh has to give them the means of that to be able to do it. Now, if they're taking that means and using it just to build big houses and cars and everything else and thinking, wow, you know, Father, thank you, I'm really blessed. It's almost like the Pharisee that's praying up to him, you know, and saying, wow, I fast, you know, three times a week and I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector. That's not the reason Yahweh blesses him. Because like he says, anything in your hand belongs to him, but it's for us to use for his glory. And that's the reason he puts it in us. So... This is the, 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 we must count the cost of discipleship. Because here we're seeing direct lines that say, unless you do this, you cannot be my disciple. You know? And he's going to say to some people, when they come up, Yeshua, Yeshua, to hug him. He's going to say, I never knew you. That's the scariest thing in my life. That's the only thing I would, that, that scares me that I would never, ever want to happen. Matthew 10 and verse 27. Matthew 10 and verse 27. He says, what I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, proclaim on the housetops. And you should not fear the ones killing the body, but not being able to kill the soul, but rather fear him being able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for an Assyrian? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground without your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Then do not fear, you are better than many sparrows. Then everyone who shall confess me before men... I will also confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Like I say, the worst insult anyone could ever give you in the world is to say, I didn't know you were a believer. People say, oh, he said Christian. Uh -huh, but I'm not a Christian. That, that, that's, that's an insult. If someone says to you, I didn't know you were a Christian, they're insulting you. Because in their mind, they don't know believer, first group, disciple, Christian. What they're saying is, if they say, I didn't know you were a Christian, is, I didn't know you were a follower of Yeshua. I didn't know you lived the New Testament as a way of life. That's what they're saying. So it's an insult. It doesn't matter the word they use. It's the greatest insult. Because you know what it's showing? It's showing you're no different than the person out there in the world. You're no different than the atheist, the liar, you know, the guy who's living for himself, that you're not being a disciple. People should see the difference. And that's why I say in the time we're living in praise Yahweh, I do believe we are making a difference. I believe we're changing. But the one thing we, we, we have to go further on, we have to stop being like the world and the world should see how we're different. And that's why I believe that, the, that Abba Yahweh brought the Amish into our midst. These were the Philadelphian era of the congregation and they're still there. Now granted, they don't have everything. I'm not saying go join the Amish tomorrow, you know, and get a little hat like that in the suspenders. Not that I'm against suspenders. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, you see people that don't compromise. You see people that believe in a way of life and they do it. And you see people that are different. And most of the people that go to visit them are because of that. They're looking for the freak show. We want to see the people that don't ride cars. We want to see the people with the different beard. And that's okay, because not everybody goes there for that. 
There's people that go there to learn how they're living because they want to exemplify them and they want to be the same way. But like he says, whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. And when we're denying him at work, you know, when we don't want to tell our co-workers that we're a believer, when we're denying him with our family that we're afraid to bring up the truth because it might ruffle feathers, we're denying him. We're denying him. And not that we want a religious spirit because that's almost just as bad, you know. But when the opportunity arises, the Bible says, 1 Peter 3.15, always have an answer in you for the hope that lies within you. Always have an answer prepared, an answer ready. It doesn't say you always have to say it, but you have to be ready to say it for when you need it. So we want to make sure that whenever we're compromising with our life as a disciple, could be with the Sabbath, the holy days, or holy living, and we're not bearing fruit, we're denying Him. You know? So this is where... You know, in your house, if, if you're cooking on Shabbat, nobody sees you maybe, and you think, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But Yahweh sees. Yahweh's seeing everything. So whenever we're compromising, we're denying Him. Matthew 10, same chapter, verse 38 and 39. He says, Whoever does not take up his staff and follow after me is not worthy of me. The one finding his life will lose it, and the one losing his life on account of me will find it. And I think this is one of the hardest things for believers living in the world today. Because this was written 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine? This wasn't even written in the 1800s. This is written 2,000 years ago when the world was completely different the way it is now. But when you become a disciple, you know, and it's hard because, like I said, I strongly, strongly suggest for our congregation to homeschool their children and to be teaching the women not to go out and get a career because some man is going to do this and then you're going to be on your own. Not teaching them that, but teaching them how to be women like Sarah of old. Teaching them how to grow up to be the women of the Bible that we want. Teaching our, 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 our boys a, 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 a useful trade where they could be serving and helping in society and also caring for their family. But it's hard. And like I said, even with the Amish society, they're going through this because without using... Uh, power tools and all these things, you know, that they lose out. The markets, everything's moving so fast. And if there was ever a time where we have to be examining this every day in our life and saying, am I losing my life or am I gaining it? What do I have to gain if I'm going to go 15 years in a public school system that even denies that Yahweh exists and I'm there day in and day out and day in and day out to come out to do what? For a job? For money? For the white picket fence? No way. No way. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'm denying him when I do that. And I'm not doing it just once. It's not like Peter. Because remember, Peter denied him in one night three times, but he made restitution pretty quick. Because there's a point where if you're denying him in your life over and over and over, you go past the point of no return. It's the same with sin. You keep sinning your life, and you keep going and going, and you're not repenting. There's a point where the Holy Spirit will leave you, and now you won't even see what you're doing is wrong anymore. You know, and then you start justifying yourself that it's not sin. You start blaming other people. So there is a point of no return that comes. But as a disciple, like I said, you know, one in a million, you have to think, am I living that life of a disciple? Or am I living the life of a master? Exodus 21. Exodus 21 and verse 23 says, but if injury occurs, you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. But if injury occurs, you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So basically we know that when we're looking at Yahweh's judicial order and justice, the punishment has to fit the crime. But here we are. Have we internalized when we're looking eye for eye and life for life that each of us has had a death penalty, you know? We have, in, in America right now, our prison ministry is just going through the roof. I mean, we have full congregations. We, it's unbelievable what's happening there in prisons because these are people that realize life for life. They realize that they're in prison. Some of them have life sentences in prison, but they realize that Yeshua paid their death penalty, that man can do whatever they want to them. They could put them in a cage. They could execute them. 
but they can't take their eternal life like I just read. Don't fear man who could kill the body. Fear him who could take the body and soul and destroy it in Gehenna. So here it is. Do we realize this as believers? Do we realize that the deeds that we committed in our life according to Yahweh's Torah are worthy of death? They're worthy of death. And that's why when Yeshua came not to do away with the Torah, but to magnify it, would he show us, you know, that it's not only murdering, you know, physically the killing of a person, which is murder, but if you think anger, you've murdered. I think every human being must have at some time in their life been angry, which means every one of us, according to Yahweh's standard, is a murderer. And Yeshua came down now to pay that penalty not so that we can go out and have the white picket fence and live good lives and then say, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Yeshua. No, he came so that he can live his life in us and that when people see us, they can see him. So that when you're reading this New Testament and they say, we have now a bunch of people contacting us from China. You know, first time they've ever heard anything with religion. And they're asking very simple questions about salvation. Did Jesus really die for sin? And I'm starting to explain to them and send them, you know, our, our lessons and share with them, you know, who he is and that he is the son of Yahweh and explain. But we have to get this in our life that the reason why you're sitting here and the reason why you're alive today is because he's living in you. And every day of your life, he wants you to exemplify the love, the mercy, you know, the kindness, the forgiveness, the happiness that he has in his spirit to others. So that when some people are brand new and they don't have the spirit of Yahweh yet and they only have the words that they don't understand because the Holy Spirit hasn't opened up their mind, they see it in you. And they say, wow, you know something? And I've had people say this to me for more than 20 years with our congregation. I see something different. I see love. I see people there that really love each other. And I say, but don't think that it just happens. <laughs> you work on it. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a choice. It's a choice that when someone treats you bad, whether you're going to treat him bad back or you're not going to do it. You're going to do like Yeshua said. Not to give evil for evil or really for it. Really. It's a choice of being a disciple or not being a disciple. Romans 12, 1 and 2. says, Therefore, brethren, I call on you through the compassion of Elohim to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly pleasing to Elohim, which is your reasonable service. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Elohim of the universe that's eternal, that lived forever, that has no beginning and no end, came to life as a human being for 33 years, pooped his pants as, as a baby in a diaper, you know, was totally dependent on a mother and a father for years. And then when he got older and revealed who he was, he suffered humiliation, spitting upon, beating, crucifixion, and death. Yeah, I think it's my reasonable service that I could allow him to live in my body that he suffered for me. And be not conformed to this age. Be not conformed to this age. Facebook, Twitter, internet, social media, all these things that, that are there for Satan, that just control and corrupt people's minds day in and day out, that are filled with nothing but gossip and maligning and, and, and Satan maneuvering people's minds. <coughs> be not conformed to this age, but be transformed by how the renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind daily to the mind of Messiah. That's what we have to be do doing. Taking every thought into captivity. So when something comes that's not of Yahweh, like I said, look at it as a dart coming. Grab it, package it, get rid of it. Don't even dwell on it. You know? Take every thought into captivity, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to prove to you what is good and pleasing in the perfect will of Elohim. And that's why Yahweh has us here. He has us here now because in these last days, he's using us as a remnant to show the world this is what it's like. And you know, when I look at the Amish, I look at them and I say, wow, in one way, I admire them, but in another way, I'm sad for them because they're not the first fruits. Because they didn't stay with the whole word of Yahweh. They stayed with the culture, they stayed with the family life, but they gave up on the Torah. They gave up on that of Yahweh. So although I think they have a special place in Yahweh's kingdom, they gave up on being a first fruit. And this is why Yahweh has us here. And in a lot of ways, you know, at least I look at my own life, I, I, I know my life is not as sanctified as their life. And it shames me. 
Because I say if people who aren't even first fruits can be that diligent to stay with what's given to them, then what am I doing with my life? And this is why as a people, Yahweh is bringing us. It's a new day. And that's why I say, when I keep saying it's time to go to the wilderness, some people might think, what on earth is he talking about? And it doesn't mean just packing up your bags and running off to, to uh, some desert in Jordan or Saudi Arabia. It's a mental mindset of coming out of this world, which S Satan is the God of, and transforming ourselves into the kingdom of Yahweh. It's a mindset. It's a mindset that you have to live in every day, but if you're going to live on it, live in that mindset, your mind has got to be transformed. Luke 17 and verse 7. <clears throat> and like I say, when you're transforming that mind, you have to put your mind into the mind of a servant, not the mind of a master. So, like I said, when you do your homework and you look at your schedule, you have to think to yourself, is your life, because if Yeshua and Yahweh are really our masters, right? Think if you were a slave, you know? Think what you would be doing every day as a slave in a house somewhere. And there's, there's people, you know, you could use the word slave or you could use the word servant, because I know even in Africa, there's uh, people that will be servants, right? They'll cook for you and clean for you and clean your house and all that stuff. And think about, that's what, the, that's what their whole existence is for, to please you. You know, because you're, 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 you're hiring them in that position. So if Yahweh now, that like I said, he could have called the Amish or he could have called, you know, a million other people beside you. The fact that you're sitting in this chair and not one of them, what does it mean in your life? So in Luke 17, 7, he says, But which of you, having a servant plowing or tending a flock, will immediately say to him coming out of the field, Come recline, right? <laughs> so here's the servant all day working outside, working hard. When he comes in... Is the first thing the master says, oh, you're working all, all day hard. Sit and recline. He says, but no. Will he not say to him, prepare something that I may eat. And having girded yourself, serve me until I eat and drink. And after these things, you will eat and drink. What thanks does he have, that servant, because he th did the thing that was commanded? I don't think so. Likewise, even you, when you've done all the things you're commanded, say that you are idle servants because you're only done what we ought to. So in the end of the day, we have nothing <clears throat> that we could glory in. Because we're only doing what's commanded us as a disciple. All the glory goes to Yahweh. And that's why I say that's what real worship is. It's not clapping for somebody who's singing. It's clapping for Yahweh. It's praising Yahweh. Yahweh gets all the praise. He gets all the glory. Because all we're doing is only what's, what, what we're... And to think about it, I'm in awe of it. I'm in awe that there could be a million people out there and he would choose me with all my imperfections, you know, people that are better qualified, that could do a hundred times better than me. And why does he do it? He says he does it because he wants to confine the mighty. He calls the weak of the world, 1 Corinthians, right, one, to confine the mighty. So would I thank him for, I say, thank you, Yahweh, that I'm just weak enough that you can, eat, that you can use me that I'm weak. Not that I'm strong, not that I think I'm better than that person out there because I'm sitting here. No, it's the opposite. Praise Yahweh, I'm weak enough to be sitting here. But at the same rate, with everything he invested in me, I don't want to let him down. I want to be there. I, I, I want to do everything in my power as a human being to, to, to make him happy and not, not discourage that, that he chose me. And that's, like I say, in, from Romans 12, our reasonable service. Matthew 6. In verse 24, <clears throat> Matthew 6 and verse 24, he says, No one is able to serve two masters, for e either he will hate the one and love the other, or will cleave to the one and despise the other. You're not able to serve Yahweh and well. So like I said, what I love about all this is it's so plain. It's not written in double language. You don't have to know Hebrew. I mean, it's so plain, like he says, you can't serve two masters. So it's pretty simple. Who is your master? You know, are you the master of your own domain, or is Yahweh the master and Yeshua of your life? You can't serve both, though. Because of this, I say to you, do not be anxious for your soul, what you'll eat and what you drink, nor for your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Observe the birds of the heaven that they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Do you not rather excel them? So it's the same as we're setting up these communities, right? That's the thing. 
How are we going to survive, right? If you leave your job, you go to the community, how are you going to do it? And that's the very thing he's saying here. If the birds, you think of these birds of heaven, right? They're not going to college. They don't have any skill. And yet Yahweh feeds them. They, and it's, it's so beautiful. He says, are you more valuable than that? That he'll take care of you? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Yet they do not labor, nor do they spin. But I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed as one of these. If Yahweh so enrobes the grass of the field, which is today, and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, will he not much rather you of little faith? Then do not be anxious, saying what we may eat, or what may, we may drink, or what may clothe us. For after all these things the nation seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these. But seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, right? Not just the kingdom, but his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Wow. So that's, the, that's where faith comes in. Faith is just believing this. But if you believe it, that's, you've got to bank on that. You know, that that's what's going to happen. That as long as you're seeking first the kingdom, doesn't mean we don't work, because he who doesn't work doesn't need, but our first vocation is to the kingdom of Yahweh. That's our first vocation. And then Yahweh will care for us after that. But we can't serve two masters. And then we look at Yeshua, John 5 and verse 30. Yeshua was a disciple of Yahweh. So we see in the judicial order structure, the same way we are disciples of Yeshua, Yeshua was a disciple of Yahweh. John 5.30 says, I am not able to do anything of my desire, but as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, for I don't seek my will, rather the will of him who sent me. So is that our prayer every day? Only seeking the will of Yahweh. We know Matthew 26 and verse 39, right? Going a little forward, he fell on his face praying, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So we see Yeshua and Yahweh are two separate, distinct beings. They both have a will, and yet Yeshua, as the disciple of Yahweh, has surrendered his will to Yahweh in all things. So when Yeshua came, he didn't tell anything of what he thought, of what he wanted to do. Everything was the will of the Father. And I say as ambassadors, because we're called ambassadors, right? That's what an ambassador does. An ambassador doesn't have a private opinion of how he feels about something. And in the news today, they try to do that. They'll try to egg an ambassador on. And well, but your private opinion, you don't agree with so-and-so. The position of the, whatever country it is, United States of America or whatever, the position of the kingdom of Yahweh is this, period. Because that's what an ambassador does. An ambassador is representing his country. So only Yahweh's will counts. All our goals and ambition, ambitions should be as a slave to Yahweh. John 7 and verse 16. John 7 and verse 16 says, Yeshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but the one who sent me. He who desires to do his will can comprehend my teaching, if it is from Elohim, or if from my own will I speak. He who speaks from his own mind's his own mind seeks glory for himself, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is no iniquity in his heart. So, wow, this is the example that we had from Yeshua. You know, Yeshua is the disciple of Yahweh, and we are the disciples of Yeshua. Romans 2.13. Romans 2.13. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous with Elohim, but the doers of the Torah shall be justified. And we're living in a time today because of technology and because of the internet, that uh, the world has put on this Greek mindset of analyzing everything and talking about everything and giving opinions for everything. But at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. At the end of the day, it's about what you do, right? And that's why when you look in Scripture, that's what Yahweh does. It's what Yahweh does before what Yahweh even says. This is what Yahweh is about. So we have to be the same way. We have to be doers of the Word, you know? And that's why, you know, years ago, when people would ask me, I stopped saying that I believe in the Sabbath. I tell people I'm a Sabbath keeper. I keep the Sabbath because it's what I do. What matter? What does it matter what I believe if I don't do it? So we want to make sure that we're doing what we believe. We're backing up what we, what we say we believe. Matthew 7 and verse 20. <clears throat> Matthew 7 and verse 20 says, Then surely from their fruits you will know them. It will not be just every... Just everyone who says to me, Master, Master, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name? 
and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many works of power, and then I will declare to them, from everlasting I never knew you, depart from me those working lawlessness. Wow. That's why I say that's the scary scripture to me. And that's why it does, you know, at the end of the day, right, I, I think in the world we live in today, we worry too much for the future. Tomorrow and the next year and ten years. And, you know, at the end of the day, the past is gone. No need to keep focusing on the past because you can never bring it back. And the future isn't here yet. But, you know, it's here today. What's here is right now what you do today. And if you're too worried about the past or too focused on the future, you're going to lose today. You're going to lose what's before you right now. And that's what we have to be doing. Because we want to make sure that we are bearing fruit. That's one of, of, of the requirements of a disciple. You must bear fruit to be a disciple. So again, you're still going to have your life. You're going to have your daily maintenance. You know, being a disciple doesn't stop us from brushing your teeth or having to shower or all the other little things you have to do. It doesn't take away from having to pre prepare food every day or homeschool our children. It doesn't stop us from having to work to physically earn money to care for our home. But at the same rate, bearing fruit for Yahweh has got to be first. That's got to take precedent over everything. Because that's the stuff you're going to be rewarded on, not the other things. The other things may be a requirement if you don't do them, you know, before the throne of Yahweh. He may say, look, you had a, you were a father, you had a wife and kids, you didn't care for them, you didn't work, you know, it, but that's only a requirement. You're not going to get any any reward simply for working a, a earthly job. But you will get reward for fruit that you bear. Very, very clearly, the Bible says it. Some bear 100, some 30, you know, some 20. <coughs> so the fruit you bear we will get rewarded based on that. And that reward is for eternity. You know, with the things you, you work on today, you get rewarded just momentarily. But the fruit that you're bearing today for the kingdom is forever. So we have to believe it with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we can't fear, how, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Because like you said, Yahweh will take care of all those things if we put in first. First Peter 2 and verse 21 says, For you were called to this, for even Messiah suffered on our behalf, leaving behind an example for us that you should follow in his footsteps. So here's another point of being a disciple, that we have to have control. Like I said, the disciple comes from the word discipline. And if you're not disciplining your life, you're, you're, you can never be a disciple. You know, there's many proverbs, I'm not going to go into them now, that talks about uh, a man with an angry spirit is no different than a demon-possessed person. So it's the key of being a disciple also... Uh, that we have to suffer as Yeshua suffered. So whether it's uh, a problem, you know, uh, with your neighbor next door to you, it's a problem with your family, or it's a problem at your job, it's a problem even in the congregation, we have to look at it from that standpoint that it's not always, because I say sometimes, even when you're right, you're wrong. Because I've seen this, I've counseled people where the one person was right and the other person was wrong, but the right person, how they were reacting in their attitude they were wrong because they were doing it in in uh, self-righteousness they were doing it in anger they didn't want to give in and like at the end of the day like the apostle peter says in first corinthians 6 why not just be wrong why not just be wrong there's many times in my life where i just said that you know what let me and, and i praised yahweh that he allowed me to be wrong because it made me more like my savior because my savior did nothing wrong and yet he was persecuted he was wrongly accused and sometimes it's a blessing that Yahweh is allowing us to be like him. And I say, you know, when you do something wrong and you ask for forgiveness, that, that it's good, you know, because we should, right? We're repenting. But when you did nothing wrong and somebody wronged you and you forgive them when you do nothing, did nothing wrong, you are actually giving grace. You're doing exactly what Yahweh does every day to us because he did nothing wrong and yet he gives us grace and forgiveness when he doesn't have to. There's no reason he has to, except it's part of his character. So when we do the same thing, when we forgive people that don't deserve forgiveness, we're becoming like Yahweh. We're becoming part of his character. And it's a blessing that we can do this. And that's why we have to think about this. As disciples, we have to suffer on behalf of the Messiah, leaving who left us an example behind that we should follow in his footsteps. John 10, John the 10th chapter. <clears throat> I'll 
read 1 through 5 and then drop down to verse 14. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you that he who does not enter into the sheepfold of the flock by the gate, but climbs up by another place, he is a thief and a robber. But the one entering through the gate is the sheep, is the shepherd of the sheep. So very clearly we see for 2,000 years, Yeshua has had judicial order in the congregation. He has had a organized, established congregation for 2,000 years. There's no doubt about it. That's not a doctrine. That's history. You could look at it. You could look in the New Testament. And like I said, if Yeshua only had to come to earth to pay the penalty of our sins, he could have did that in three days and three nights. He didn't have to take two to three years to do that. Why did he take two to three years? Because he trained. He trained 12 apostles, right? And he had to train them in the doctrine. He had to train them in the character. And then those people went and trained others and trained others and trained others. That's the way it comes. So somebody just doesn't come. It doesn't matter if you were a Catholic priest or a Protestant minister or just a good guy or somebody that maybe knew how to play the guitar. You don't come to faith and then the next day you're calling yourself an elder, a rabbi, a priest, or whatever else you call yourself because you haven't been ordained to that. You, you, you haven't been trained to that. That's what we say. That anyone who comes up and climbs up another place, he's a thief and a robber. And that's what's causing chaos. And I say, if Yeshua returned today to this earth, which congregation would he walk into? You have two million congregations all claiming they believe in the New Testament, all claiming they believe in the person in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Messiah. And yet, in, 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 in a town, if you go to Johannesburg, how many churches are in that one big town there? They have no connection to each other. They're not united. They don't do anything together. They're all separate. So what, what example of that is to the atheist? What example to that is to the, the non-believer? It's, it's, it's chaos. You know, There's one body. There's one faith. And yet today there's two million. Why? <clears throat> because of this. Because people are not following the order that Yeshua set down. He set the order. They're coming in from another way. And at the end of the day, we can prove it. The Gates of Hell book, like I said, 250 some odd uh, uh, references there that prove it. That's only one book. There's many other references that aren't even in that book that show the same thing, that there has always been an organized body. And I'm not saying we're the only part. We're just maybe a little finger of that body, but we're part of that body. You know? But that's the way you got to come. You have to come through the, 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 the one body, the one faith, the one baptism. The doorkeeper opens to him and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes in front of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will not follow a foreigner, never. But they will flee from him because they know the voice of the stranger. So for us, when we look, and I'm not going to name any names, but when we look at these charlatans that are out there, because there, there's many, many, many of them selling videotapes. You know, I've heard this. My whole life as a believer, you know. I have something that they you have to have for salvation. You can't get salvation without what I'm going to give you. And it's $49.99. <laughs> if you buy two, DV, two DVDs, it's $79.99. It's like, come on. Come on. People can't see that that's fake. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and yet there's people out there going for that. You know, freely you receive, freely you give. And there's people out there following these charlatans. But he says, his sheep would never do that. They'll never follow that. And it's chaos because they're all saying something different. You know, there's something that's called the, at least it was there a long time ago. I don't know if it's still there today, the Prophecy Club. Uh, if you've ever heard of it. But uh, they would have these weekend meetings there, right? And there'd be 30 teachers. And you'd have one guy get up there and say, America is Babylon, and then the next teacher comes up there and says the Catholic Church is Babylon, and then the next teacher comes up there and says Saudi Arabia is Babylon. It's like, if I'm sitting in that audience, i got to think, what's going on here? Give me my money back, because you have to pay $50 to get into the meeting, too. You know? But that's what it is. It's chaos. So when people are going to Satan's Internet looking for you know, the tickling of the ears, they're going to get messed up. But he says very clearly here, his sheep, they will never follow a foreigner. Never. They will flee from him because they, because they do not know the voice of the strangers. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know those that are mine, and I am known by the ones that are mine. So that's the key to it. And like I say, there's a cost to it. You know, there's a cost when we're offended. There's a cost when we have friends that may leave the truth, you know, and, and, and we have to cut off relationships with them. You know, there's a cost to it when... When, when, when things happen in our life, there's a cost. There's a cost to even just tithing, you know, giving 10%. Although, 
you know, with tithing, if you realize Yahweh's way, it always works in our favor anyway. <laughs> you know, it just happens that way. You can't explain it to somebody. But it's still a cost. It's still faith to take that money initially and to be, be putting it aside. So there is a cost that's involved. Proverbs 15 and verse 31. <clears throat> Proverbs 15 and verse 31. It says, The ear that hears the reproof of life shall remain among the wise. He who ignores correction despises his own soul, but he who hears reproof gets a sound heart. The fear of Yahweh is instruction and wisdom, and before honor is humility. Right? Before somebody, and that's why it says, do not lay hands on anybody speedily. That before somebody, one of the qualifications of an elder is not a, a, a new member so that he doesn't get puffed up. And uh, it's important that we understand that the fear of Yahweh is instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. So the fear of Yahweh is the first gateway to the kingdom. It comes through everything. And the reason why we follow judicial order, it's not because there's good teachers that we have, although I hope we do have good teachers, but it's because we have the fear of Yahweh, because we understand that Yahweh put in order there. And you know what? Through time, it's like anything else. You know, in, in, in South Africa, there's probably good leaders you had and bad leaders you had. But when you have a bad leader, you don't go in and handing your citizenship and say, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, you, you, you bear through it and you try to be the best citizen you can be and you, you leave it up to Yahweh. We see it in the Bible. You know, if you look at most of the kings of Israel and Judah were bad men. They weren't good. You could name on one hand probably the good kings they had and they were all from Judah. There wasn't one good king from Israel. So what are you going to do? You know, Yahweh allowed that kingship to be there, and you have to just trust in Yahweh. You don't say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my, uh, I'm not going to be an Israelite anymore because we had a bad king that was here. No. <clears throat> the fear of Yahweh leads us to obedience and humility. It's the fear of Yahweh. And people could say whatever they want to say about not following a man or this and that. The reason why people don't want to be under judicial order is because they have a Laodicean spirit. Because everybody follows somebody. The problem is the Laodicean follows themselves. Everybody's following somebody. And at the end of the day, it's the same way because this stuff that comes up with, whether it's the rotating Sabbath or the earth is flat, nobody who's contacting me with that is just coming up with that. I've never had someone write me and say, I just woke up, I had a dream last night that the earth is flat. <laughs> they're reading it from somebody else. The thing is, though, they're looking for teachers who don't ask for accountability because that's the lay of the same spirit. But everybody is following somebody. But they don't want accountability the same way that Satan doesn't want accountability. But for us, it's the fear of Yahweh because we do fear Yahweh and we do fear going against him that we understand that we're obedient to his judicial order because of our fear for him and because it humbles us. And like I said, no good, better, or different what happens to you, if at the end of the day something humbles you, it's good. <laughs> Because all of us need humbling, you know, and we have to continue to need humbling. Matthew 23 and verse 10. Matthew 23 and verse 10. I'll read 10 through 13, then drop down to verse 23. He says, Nor be called master, for one is your master, the Messiah. But he who is greater of you, let him be your servant. And whoever will exalt himself will be humbled, and whoever will humble himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven before men, for you do not enter, nor do you allow those entering to go in. Drop down to verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and dill and cumin, and you have left aside the weightier matters of the Torah, judgment and mercy and faith. And these things were necessary for you to have done, and these things you should not have forgotten. So that's what I say. You know, I challenge anybody when they're talking about are we under grace or law, never anywhere in the New Testament, including all 14 of Paul's epistles, is that ever the question. It's never the question that you have to choose grace or law. They're two to totally different things, and the purpose for both are totally different. Grace is Yahweh's unmerited pardon on us who are already sinners, who already have a penalty that we can't pay, to take that penalty away by the death of his son. And law, Torah, is there to teach us skillful living, to teach us, how, now that we're under this new way of life, how to treat our neighbor, how to worship him, 
So they're, they're not even connected in the way that you have to choose one over the other, you know? That's like saying, would you rather have uh, a turkey sandwich or mayonnaise? Well, can I have mayonnaise on the sandwich? You know? <laughs> like, that's logical. Why do you have to choose one over the other when they go together, you know, and they work together? So we need obedience, but not self-righteousness. And our focus, although every word of Yahweh is important, and, you know, whether it's... Uh, clean and unclean meats, whether it's wearing tzitzit, whether it's uh, mixed clothing, no matter what it is, you know, and, uh, you know, like the old bumper sticker, Yahweh said it, I believe it, that settles it. And sometimes, me and Elder Wilco will have discussions on things like, you know, why uh, a child is uh, not supposed to leave the house, you know, the uh, male child for 40 days and the female child for 80 days, right? And, you know, and you might think of things in your mind that sound good for this and that. And, and sometimes you say at the end of the day, what does it matter if we know why he said it? He said it, right? He said it. So we do it because he said it. And there's definitely a reason for everything. But do I need to know the exact reason of everything? Of course not. That's where faith comes in, that everything that Yahweh said is good for me. So there's things that, that I did in faith, not knowing, like mixed clothing. I always thought, what on earth is that? And it wasn't until later that you find out sometimes, we you know, with synthetic clothing and certain things that are unhealthy for, for sweating and those kind of things. But, but it doesn't matter. What matters is he said it and we're doing it for that. But at the same rate, this calling isn't, it, it isn't about those things. Those are just tiny points of life that Yahweh said that are the right ways to do it. Our calling is about the weightier matters of the law. That's what it's about, right? You know, so... Our, 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 our being, Yahweh's being, is the love, the mercy, the faith, the kindness. And we have to internalize those things because that's what we should be exhibiting every day of our life. Whether it's with our husband and wife, whether it's correcting our children, it's with, with our neighbor. And you really, because sometimes uh, just letting a matter go is not mercy because you, you, you're not showing love to the person who committed the crime. You know, if there's not a punishment. And this is where really you have to put on the spirit of Yahweh and the mind of Messiah to find out when is the time to say, okay, you know, he punished enough. and Or the time to say, even though it hurts me, it's my child, I need to punish them more or they're not going to learn. And this is where we need, to, as disciples, we need to be. So where every word out of the mouth of Yahweh is important and we go by, we do have to understand like Yahweh does. There are ways to imagine the Lord. And that's what Yeshua said. You didn't have to choose one over the other. So he's not... He's not condemning them because they tied the mint and the cumin. He's just saying to them, the weightier matters of the Lord were more important, and you could have did the weightier ones without not doing the ones that weren't as weightier. So all is important. John 7, 24. John 7, 24. Do, do not be judging by hypocrisy, rather judge with a just judgment. And to me, it's one of the saddest things of the Torah movement that's come probably started in the late 1990s. Like I said, I've been a believer since the early 1980s. So I've seen this whole movement that's come in the world. And in the beginning, I thought it was really good that people were leaving worldly churches and coming back to the Torah. But now, where it's gone to, this whole messianic movement, which is very messy, <laughs> I see, wow, I, I almost think they were better off staying in their, their, their churches. Because today, if I meet somebody who's just coming out of Catholicism, or coming out of uh, you know an organized church, it's much easier to teach them than a messianic that's kind of mixed everything in together. And now, you know, where do you start from? You know, they have all of this different uh, mixture that that's in there. So uh, we want to make sure we're judging not by appearance, but we're judging by righteous judgment. Matthew nine and verse nine. Matthew nine and verse nine. <coughs> And passing by from there, Yeshua saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And rising up, he followed him. And it happened, as he reclined in the, in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners having come, these were reclining with Yeshua and his disciples. And seeing the Pharisees said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But Yeshua hearing, he said to them, the healthier are not in need of a doctor, but rather those that are sick. But going, learn what this is. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call righteous ones, 
but sinners to repentance. So we don't want to have a self-righteous attitude that we could see the sin in everybody else, but we don't see it in ourselves. You know? And it really is profound when you think about that. Because we're living in a world today that is such a facade, you know, and fake news is really such a good term that's coined because everything is fake news. And you'll see out there that when, the, when, when it fits the public narrative, they want to take somebody who may have went to prison for doing whatever, maybe dealing in drugs or whatever, and say, what a righteous person this person is because in prison they've turned their life around and they've done these things. And that might be true, and it's good to do that and commend the person that did that. But then on the other side, they'll look for dirt on a politician or somebody else from 30 years ago just to, to, to try to cut that person down for their narrative. And, and the same people are doing it. And that's why I say everything is fake news out there today. Everything you see. And people are not looking at Yeshua saying, I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And that should be us. You know, People come into the congregation from every way of life. Some were in prison before. You know, some were child molesters. Some were, were molested themselves. All kinds of bad things. You know, but their new life, they've changed. And it's not about keep thinking about what's behind, but like the Apostle Paul said, it's about looking ahead. And it's the most evilest thing in the world to try to dig dirt up on people's past and then try to pass it around. You know, well, you know, he did this there. And 40 years ago, this person did this. And when he was in high school, it's like, wow, that is, that's like, that. you can't get more contrary to this message that I'm talking about than doing that. You know, and it's so sad. And, and in a time where Yahweh is going to the highways and the byways and giving people a chance for repentance, you have no idea how many people I've counseled with over the last X amount of years that that was the one thing holding them back from faith. Because they felt like, Yahweh will never accept me. He'll never accept my repentance because I'm being told by everybody how evil I am and that I can't. And it's like, that is Satan the devil. Because Yahweh tells us, when, when, when Peter asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Because seven is number of completeness. And he said, no, 77 times 77. So if Yahweh would ask us to forgive over and over and over when someone's making the same mistake, right? If, 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 if they're struggling, but their heart is right, would he not do the same for us? And you can never, ever, ever think that, well, I've gone too far. You know, Yahweh will never forgive me now. I've done this again. No, that's Satan talking. And that's exactly what Satan wants to believe. But as disciples, that's why we have to encourage people when they fall. You know, we don't want to accept the sin. We might have to put somebody away from the body for a while, but it's not because, because we're against them. It's because we love them. And we want them to see what they did wrong, and we want them to repent. But once they come back, that's it. It's over. Once they're repented, we don't keep bringing up, you know, the same. Yahweh puts it from the east to the west, and we need to do the same also. Romans 3 and verse 23. Romans 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of Yahweh. And unless you realize that in your life, unless, like I said, you internalize in your life that you're that person on, on, on death row, you know, and it's five minutes to midnight, and they're coming, and they're going to execute you, and the call comes in from heaven and says there's been a reprieve, you know, the, the, the sentence has been uh, fulfilled, Yeshua paid the penalty for you when they open up that gate and they let you go free. Unless you internalize that as a reality, because it's every one of our story. You know, We may all have stories of how we came to faith. We may have stories of different things in our life, but we all have that same story. Every one of us was on death row waiting for that. And by that now, you know, the very definition of grace is not only the unmerited pardon, but it's wanting to give back now. And what do you give back to Yahweh? You know, I say that on Father's Day. What do you give to the dad that owns the universe? <laughs> you know, do you give him a moon from Saturn? <laughs> no. But you know what you can give him? You can give that same grace to somebody else in your life. And that's what makes him happy. You know, and that's, that, that's what we need to do. We need to be encouraging each other in going that way. So, unless we realize how evil we are and the need for Yahweh's grace, we'll never act like a true disciple. It'll always be from self-righteousness. It'll be a matter of we'll be looking at uh, uh, putting ourselves above others because we know the Sabbath or we know where the true Temple Mount is or we know these things. And they're all good things to know. Like I said, it's all truth. But that's not what makes us special. 
You know, what did he say? How all men will know you're my disciple by knowing the true temple. Man. <laughs> no. He said, all men will know you're my disciple by your love one for another. And that's why I say, what I see happening in our congregation, I am so touched and moved and in awe of because it's the spirit of Yahweh. Because, believe me, I've been around a long time, you know, 35, going on 36 years. Elder Fred was also in Church of God. And we had some good congregations and good people. But I've never seen to the point where people could actually live together in harmony. You know? And we're there. We have a ways to go. <laughs> you know, we have a ways to go. And we're going to learn from it. But we're there. We're doing it. And people want to do it. And praise Yahweh, that's all part of discipleship. Jacob 2 and verse 8. Jacob 2 and verse 8 says, If you truly fulfill the royal love according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So speak and act as men being about to be judged through a law of liberty. For, um, in verse 12 now, now verse 13. For judgment will be without mercy to the ones not showing mercy. And by mercy you will be raised above judgment. So, like I said, this is one of the hardest things I've had to deal with as an elder. Because understanding what this means. Because mercy is not always, like I said, just allowing something to go away. And you have to show mercy, but at the same time, sometimes you have to make someone accountable out of love, you know, or they're not going to learn the lesson from it. But how much mercy and love do we show others is a reflection on how much we received. How much mercy and love you're going to show to others, it's a reflection of how much you feel in your life from Yahweh. Because it's natural. You know, like I said, if, if you were uh, out on a boat... And that boat capsized, and you were dying, and all of a sudden there's a hand that pulled you and saved your life. You would, you would feel such a, 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 a debt to that person forever, because that person saved your life and risked their life. Not only saved yours, but maybe they, maybe they even died when they were doing that. And if you saw that person's child 20 years later, the one who saved your life and died while he was saving you, you'd be like, do you want some coffee? Have some of this? How can I help you? Because it's just natural. That if somebody did that. So how much love and compassion and mercy you're showing to others, it's a direct reflection of how much you feel in your life from Yahweh. You know, and we need we need to be internalizing this. Uh, Luke 6 and verse 31. A few more scriptures. And we'll finish. Luke 6 and verse 31. And according as you desire that men should do to you, you also do the same to them. And if you love those who love you, what thanks is there to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what is your blessing? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you hope to receive, what is your blessing? For sinners lend to sinners, so that they may receive the equal things. But love your enemies, do good and lend, to, lend and do not cut off the hope of man. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the evil and the cruel ones. Therefore, be merciful, even as your Father also is merciful. So, like I said, as a disciple, direct reflection of how much mercy and love we're showing the others is how much we feel in our life. Matthew 20 and verse 25. Matthew 20 and verse 25. <clears throat> And Yeshua called to them and said to them, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles or their masters and their nobles are in authority over them. But it will not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they were going out from Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, two blind ones sitting beside the way, hearing that Yeshua was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have pity on us, Master, Son of David. But the crowd rebuked them, that they be quiet. But they cried out the more, saying, Have pity on us, Master, Son of David. And stopping, Yeshua called them and said, What do you desire that I do to you? What do you desire that I do to you? And they said to him, Master, our eyes be opened. And being moved with pity, Yeshua touched their eyes, and instantly their, eye, their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So, you know, being a disciple, it's not 
just uh, a canned thing like, okay, this Sunday we're all going to go out to help the poor. And, you know, we get together on Sunday, we have our little bag, and we go out, we look for poor people and homeless people. That's fine to do. I've done it for years and years and years. But it's so much more than that. It's about, because we see here's Yeshua. It was something that was natural to him. This wasn't canned. He's going somewhere, doing something. And yet somebody came from the side that was not part of what he was doing, and he had pity on that person. He had pity on the person and healed them. And it has to be the same with us. Because sometimes I've seen people that when it's okay... Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we help poor people. Monday morning when they're on their way to work and someone's broken down on the road, they don't have the time to stop and help. So being a disciple, it's got to be, it's, it's, it's our life vocation. It's not just something we do at a certain time. It's our life vocation. It should be everything about us. It should be everything that's, that's part of our character. And I love, if you read the New Testament, look how many times that Yeshua will just show mercy and kindness because it was part of him, you know. When he's going the Nain, you know, and he's on his way to something else, wherever he's on his way to do and to teach, and he sees a mother who lost her only son, and because he has so much mercy on him, and he sees this mother crying, he stops and touches the coffin and raises that person up. Now, that wasn't part of the original plan, you know. He's just going by, and he's just seeing this. But we have to be the same way, that we can't be so short-sighted in the world we live in today that we only put on eyes of, of, of mercy on Sabbath, you know, that we come uh, with our Sabbath suit on. It's got to be something we live every day. And it's hard in this world because we do have commitments. And when you're on your way to work and you may have to be there by a certain time, and if you're late, maybe even getting fired, and you see that person on the side of the road broken down, and you have to make a choice now, you know. Do I stop and help this person and risk losing my job, or do I keep going and think, ah, he's got a cell phone, somebody else will help him, you know. It's, it's, it's a world that's out there that is so contrary to our vocation as a disciple. It's the whole reason why Yeshua says you've got to come out of that world. You've got to come out of that world. And he's been telling us this for 2,000 years. But now, like I said, we're at the top of Mount Zion. The kingdom of Yahweh is just over the horizon. And now it's pretty much the last chance. Now it's the time that he is gathering his elect. He's pulling this together. He's calling the people from the highways and the byways and praise him that he's allowing us to be a little part of this. But the kingdom of Yahweh is here. The kingdom of Yahweh is, 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 is at the doors, you know. And if ever there was a time to look at this, the cost of discipleship, and really make that full commitment, it's now. It's now, you know. I mean, like I said, it's not only the last generation, it's the five to midnight of the last generation. We're not at the beginning of it because we know the beginning of the last generation was when Israel becomes a nation. Seventy years have gone by from Israel being a nation. You know, 70 is an end point number. And like I said, I find it really interesting that after that time, they, they can't form a government. They can't seem to move ahead from here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all part of the plan of Yahweh that's moving ahead. Last scripture is John 4.34. Where Yeshua said to them, My food is that I should do the will of him who sent me, and I may finish his work. So that needs to be with our our mindset is, you know, that our our food, you know, because what is food? Food is what keeps you alive, food is what you is your 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 your, your substance every day. That what keeps us alive, what keeps us going, should be to do the work of Yahweh and finish his work. Because you know what? Somebody told me one time when I was traveling years ago, they said, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, I admire so much, you know, what you're doing and, and traveling and how, how you're bringing the good news. And I said, don't admire it. It's something every one of us should be doing. <laughs> I'm not doing anything that every one of us should be doing, not necessarily traveling around the world, but bringing the good news to the kingdom. You know, that's something we do every day of our life. So I'm not doing anything more than every single disciple should be doing. That should be the first part of our vocation. And like I said, you, you, it doesn't have to be always with a, with a little letter or a tract. That when, when you see somebody that's on the side of the road broken down and you help them, you're being a disciple. You know? I know years ago when I used to send out some of the miracles in Israel because we would see many miracles, casting out demons and different things. And people would write me and say, well, I want, to, I want to come and stay with you in Israel. I want to see one of these miracles. And I'd say, for every day there was a miracle, there were 360 days that, you know what we do? 
we would pray before we would go out. We lived in the old city, me and my wife, and we would just go out looking for people. A lot of times it was helping an old woman carry her bags to her house. And we would never even start to, to mention the good news unless there was an avenue for it. We didn't want to be sacrilegious on just, you know, oh, I'm doing this because, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for your sure. <coughs> we would mention it when the time was right. We would always be ready to have that answer. But it would just be helping somebody, you know. Whether that's somebody who, uh, I think at times in a McDonald's, you stop for a coffee and you see someone there crying. And we just go up, there's something wrong, you know, putting, tapping somebody on the shoulder and just comforting them, sharing with them, you know, a word of encouragement. You know, my wife always brings little scripture cards. At the airport, this happened one time. And the woman who was crying happened to be, her father was one of the top people in the government who had just died. And she's so much appreciated. You know, because sometimes you feel uncomfortable. You see someone crying, you don't know what to do, and you think, well... You know, and you might pray for them, and that's good. But sometimes all they need is a little word, you know. And that's, that's what our life is. We need to internalize Yahweh's grace and know that Yeshua paid His life for our life. Then we will live in a constant state of humility, wanting to do the will and work of the one who saved us. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. This is the cost of being a disciple, to give our life for the life that Yeshua paid His death penalty for us on our behalf. And then allow Him to live His life in us as true, spirit-begotten, loving, merciful disciples of His. So, Yahweh bless. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.